All right, hello everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds on this Monday afternoon. Uh, really looking forward to our presentation today and, and to introduce today's special guest speaker. Uh, I'll introduce our own Dr. Dahlia Risk. Thank you, Dr. Weissman. Um, it is my honor to uh, welcome Dr. Darylin Moyer. She is the Executive VP, CEO of American College of Physicians. She's board certified in internal medicine infectious disease uh, and has been a fellow of ACP since 2007. FACP is an honorary designation that recognizes ongoing individual service and contributions to the practice of medicine. She has served on ACP's Board of Regents, which manages the business affairs of ACP, as well as is the main policymaking body of the college. She's chaired ACP's Board of Governors uh, and has served as the governor of ACP's Pennsylvania Southeastern Chapter. She also serves on the Board of Directors for the Council of Medicine Subspecialty Societies, which is where I've had the pleasure of getting to know Dr. Moyer, and is a president uh, and chair of the Board of Directors uh, of the Patient-Centered Primary Care Collaborative. Dr. Moyer is also a member of Women of Impact and is the 2020 recipient of the American Medical Women's Association Elizabeth Blackwell Award, as well as a recipient of the 2020 Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University's Alumni Achievement Award. Prior to becoming ACP's EVP and CEO, Dr. Moyer was a professor of medicine, executive vice chair of education for the Department of Medicine, internal medicine residency program director, and assistant dean for GME at Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. She was previously co-faculty advisor for Temple University School of Medicine internal medicine interest group and for Temple University School of Medicine student education about healthcare policy. She received Temple University School of Medicine Women in Medicine Mentoring Award in 2012. Dr. Moya's research and scholarly activities uh, are, have to do with medical education, high value care, patient safety, professionalism and digital media, gender equity, as well as HIV infectious diseases. She's received her Bachelor of Arts degree in bio, uh, Biological Basis of Behavior, Biology and Psychology from the University of Pennsylvania and has attended medical school at Temple University School of Medicine. She has a completed internal medicine residency at Temple as well as served as its chief resident um, and went on to complete infectious disease uh, fellowship at UCLA Medical Center. She is currently still practicing with all of that responsibility at Temple University uh, IMA. Um, on a personal no note, I've gotten to know Dr. Moyer through her various uh, leadership roles at ACP, and she's just a wonderful leader, advocate. Uh, the policies that the society um, really focuses on, I think, are of interest to all of us, um, particularly fond of what she's done um, for, for women um, and, and just gender um, and diversity, equity, inclusion issues overall. I'm very, very impressed. So Dr. Moyer, I don't want to take up the entire session uh, with all of your um, amazing um, leadership uh, and contributions, but so grateful that you have taken the time to join us today. Thank you very much for that nice introduction and my, the imposter phenomenon call, comes upon me uh, with those types of introductions because it really does take a village and there's lots of folks that are part of the internal medicine and the greater village of healthcare. And uh, Dr. Risk, I've gotten to know through uh, her service as the SHM representative on the Council of Subspecialty Societies for the ACP. And of course, I know Dr. Andy Dunn very well, um, as he too was a, a Board of Governors Chair for the ACP and actually chaired the Board of Regents um, a couple of years ago. Um, so um, let's get started. Uh, and I think when you saw the title and you wondered and thought about the word Jedi, you may have thought about them. Um, but you may not have thought about them. Um, and so just to give you some quick disclosures, I'm full-time uh, at the college um, and I have no conflicts uh, um, of interest to disclose. Many thanks to physician and society organizational um, staff for sharing content used in this presentation. I want to give a, a shout out to Dr. Susan Thompson Hingle, who really got the college started in a big way on this journey. We have two current college officers, Dr. Jacqueline Fincher as our president, Dr. Heather Ganser as our chair, and our uh, one of our past presidents, Dr. Ana Maria Lopez, uh, all women in the college. Um, and so the ACP leadership really reflects um, uh, 
in a, in a good proportion, um, the number of women that we have as rank and file members. So we're going to go over some data today, but I'm not going to hit you with too much data because there really is a tsunami of data that demonstrates inequities. Um, I'm going to talk about what those obstacles are, but I really want to focus on how we can all work together to employ actionable interventions. So like a mini mental status test, the pink elephant, the ladies bathroom, the crowded intersection, an energized village to do the right thing, and the iceberg are the, the six things I want you to remember and take, take away from this. So the pink elephant in the room here is that when we have more diversity, engagement, and inclusion at the leadership levels of our organization, it isn't that others get less, it's that we all get more. It's not a zero sum game. And the other elephant in the room is that it takes all hands on deck, particularly the folks that are in the power positions at organizations to make sure that they are strongly advocating and actively advocating for equity. Because we know, and if you look at the gender equity literature, and it's the same for other types of equity, the more equitable environment we have, we have increased productivity, creativity, communication, job satisfaction, engagement, and policy development. Now, for many women out there, you may feel like I sometimes feel, like the women in this uh, cartoon from the New Yorker are, we're doing everything we can to make him comfortable short of dressing up as male doctors. And this is sometimes how it feels for us. I'm at PGY 36, and I can tell you I've had that feeling a lot. Um, so let's talk about how we can all work together to fix it. Um, so if you take a look at the factors that account for differences in starting pay, and this is Losasso's study from last year that was a follow-up to his study in 2011. And essentially they looked at every possible mitigating factor for why women would be earning less than men. And this was an, actually a study done of New York physicians, and they could not find the reasons for those gender gaps. ACP did our own member survey in 2018 that we published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And once again, even controlling for all those factors, the salary for men was about $50,000 higher um, than for women when physicians were married or partners and about $52,000 um, higher when physicians were not married or partnered. And if you take a look at the AAMC database, this is data from 2019, whether at the level of instructor, assistant professor, professor or chairs, women earned less than men. And although we're making some progress uh, in the pathway along here, and this is the, the group of women in medicine and sciences does this study about every 10 years. And you can see from 2003 to 2004 on the left to 2013 to 14 on the right, there has been some progress along the academic um, progression for women. But we really are um, really only seeing a moving of the needle. And what we really need is to shift the tectonic plate. If we take a look at representation of women in academic medicine, the most recent data from AAMC 2018 to 19, less than 20% of deans and department chairs at US academic institutions are women. And we know now, of course, that over 50% of uh, the students, medical students at allopathic schools in the United States are women. And if you take a look at um, Hispanic, Latino women or black women, it's even worse. And if you take a look at full professors by AAMC data, um, it is less than 1% causing Dr. Julie Silver to really call it an inexorable zero. It's essentially zero. So um, there is an initiative called Her Time Is Now, Dr. Quinn Capers, who's a cardiologist, um, who basically says women physicians have been shown to outperform men in terms of following evidence-based guidelines. There's no rational explanation for why so many brilliant women are underpaid and underpromoted in academia. Now, I don't wanna make this an us versus them. I think we can all learn from each other how we can 
make patient care better. So signals that were coming out of these studies, I think are critical to pay attention to so that we can all improve our team-based care. So there is a strong signal on the quality of care of women and underrepresented in medicine physicians in terms of being more likely to serve underserved patients. Women physicians are more likely to provide patient-centered communication and health counseling compared to their male counterparts. They are more likely to receive guideline recommendation treatment for their patients and may have better clinical outcomes. Again, a lot of data here to sort of sort, sort through and to see where those signals lead us somewhere. And underrepresented in medicine patients are more likely to consent to both preventative and health services if the recommending physician was also underrepresented. And we certainly know, and especially given the higher rates of professional dissatisfaction and burnout that we're seeing overall in our healthcare professionals, professionals we know that gendered expectations are a lot for women and are probably contributing to the higher burnout that they're seeing. Mark Linzer um, uh, published this um, three years ago in JGEM. And what they found was that female physicians are more likely to have female patients and patients with more medical complexity. Up to 60% excess in burnout in female physicians versus male physicians. And patients, whether they are women or men, have differing expectations in empathy, listening time, decisiveness, which have implication for patient evaluations. Both men and women patients expect more from their female practitioners. Some organizations have actually adjusted their patient satisfaction metrics and removed bias from these metrics. So how do we solve for this issue? We should maybe think about adjusting for patient gender and compensation plans. Got to educate everyone. Should we be co-locating behavioral medicine specialists, particularly in primary care practices, since we know that women practitioners are more likely to deal with mental health and socio-behavioral issues uh, in their patients? And should we be just adjusting visit times? There was an interesting study that came out last year that said women spend a lot more time also charting in the EHR. They all spend on average a couple of minutes more in the room. And if we took the accumulation of that time over a year, that would amount to three weeks of extra time that women are putting into face-to-face -face care and charting on the EHR. And the reason why making sure you have a professionally satisfied workforce is because it has big impact on patient outcomes. When you have a more professionally satisfied group of healthcare professionals, patient adherence improves, medical errors decrease, physician retention increases, and patient satisfaction overall goes up. So this is actually an article from Dr. Quinn Capers on the perceptions of diversity in cardiology. And this was a survey of cardiovascular fellowship program directors that was published last summer in the journal of the AHA. And I urge that you take a look at this article because this has the germane references that I talked about, about the signals that we're getting about potentially better outcomes um, for uh, patients uh, when they are cared for by underrepresented folks and by women in medicine. And again, what can we learn for that? So in order to know where you need to go, you need to know where you are and taking a look at your data with a transparent equity lens is critical. So when they surveyed the cardiovascular program directors in 2015, 6% of cardiology fellows self-ID'd as underrepresented. And this is a slightly increased in 2018. Um, and remember that when we look at the US population overall, um, we have now close to actually 20% Latino, Latina, Hispanic, uh, about 13 to 14% Black, and about 1% to 2% Native American. So this was a survey that was sent out by the ACC Cardiovascular Training Program, and they had 110 um, responses out of a total of 193. 84% said that underrepresented folks were underrepresented at their institution. About 70% believed that diversity is a driver of excellence in the healthcare cert setting. About 30% were uncertain or didn't believe the statement. About two thirds of the program said, our program is diverse 
already, so diversity doesn't need to be increased. About 37% wanted to increase diversity, but only 6% actually listed diversity as a top three priority when creating fellowship rank lists. And less than half of the programs that were surveyed had a plan for how to actualize that diversity that they wanted. And if you took a look at the top three factors for ranking for those cardiovascular fellowship program directors, it was clinical skills and acumen, Number two was ability to fit in and be a team player, whatever that means, and research productivity. Those were the top three priorities of these programs as evidenced in the graph. And you can see way at the bottom at 6% was the diversity priority. So how do we get to a better place here? And I'm gonna give you an example from Dr. Reimer and Dr. Pam Douglas from Duke. This was published a couple months ago in JAMA Network, what Network Open. They initiated a broad sweeping multi-pronged initiative over a course of five years from 2015 to 2019 that started with a, essentially a task force that drafted recommendation. They looked at five different domains and post their intervention, they saw a 25% increase in applications and interviewed applicants went from 20% to over a third in women and 14% to 20% in the underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. Matriculated fellows over that five year time went from 27% to 54% women, 6% to a third underrepresented ethnic and, my, and um, minority groups. And overall women and or, because of the intersectionality here, uh, underrepresented racial and ethnic group went from 28% to 67% with no significant changes nationally during this intervention period. And guess what? They were still amazingly high quality um, folks that, that met the bar for all the other standards. And the bonus was that those fellows looked more like the patients that they were caring for at their institution. If you take a look at cardiology studies, and this is a pr the proportion of women as cardiovascular clinical trial investigators and on leadership committees for all those great acronym names of the cardiology studies. These were published in NEGEM, JAMA, and Lancet. Less 50% or less um, of the studies and the committees had women on them. So we've got to build bridges over troubled waters. And this is Campbell's article from JAMA Network Open last year, pointing out that, that since the late 70s, the percent of black men in entering medical school classes has been flat. There has been no increase. Blacks comprise 13% of the US population, but only 5% of physicians and less than 7% of recent med school graduates. After the 1910 Flexner report, four out of 10 historically black medical schools remained open. But if you extrapolate data um, and do a modeling, you could see that if those schools had remained open, there would have been a 29% increase in black physicians in 2019. The other interesting point that they do make in this article is that of the 30 new medical schools that have been approved by LCME and opened since 2000, um, and none of them, zero, were located at historically black colleges and universities, and none were specifically focused on health disparities. There has been one school that has been open with a traditionally marginalized and excluded group of folks. And that is the Cherokee Nation and Oklahoma State University um, School of Medicine, which was established recently as the OSU School of Osteopathic Medicine at Cherokee Nation. And what's ironic about this is that we know that just like women, physicians from historically black medical schools are disproportionately going to pursue clinical practice research and advocacy that target the needs of medically underserved communities. So we really need to look, review all the opportunities and start very, very early to figure out how we improve this pathway into medicine so that we can more um, reflect the patients that we're caring for. Whoops. So, and reflecting on this is Dr. Uh, Eliza Chin, the AMWA CEO. 
where she says the partnership of institutions, med societies, academic journals are gonna be a pivotal step in ensuring systemic change that addresses gender equity within the full context of diversity and inclusion. Now, here's the ACP Board of Governors in 1982. And as you see, virtually all men in this picture. And absolutely, we are, um, we are evolving to look more like physicians in our organization and ultimately our patients. And Dr. Julie Silver um, published an article that looked at 10 years of national uh, professional medical societies over the decade in terms of the proportion of women presidents. Again, this is a signal. Um, and we saw that folks like the American Geriatric Society and the American Psychiatric Society demonstrated about a half and half mix, whereas many, many societies were in the zero to 10% range. And when we look at professional society uh, board of trustees, regents and directors, um, we see that there is a broad range uh, across the board in terms of women sitting at the board. Um, Dr. Reshma Jagsi published an article last year in Academic Medicine, where she also looked at the highest elected leaders um, and what the percentage increase. And what she found was that over um, a 15 year time period from 2000 to 2015, 10 societies increased the mean percentage of women serving on their govern governing boards by over 10% over that study period. And they're listed there, AAD, ACP, Endocrine Society, IDSA, American Society of Nephrology, ASCO, ATS, American Academy, um, of uh, neurosurgery, American Academy of Pediatrics, um, American College of Radiology. Now, another interesting data analysis that everyone should be doing at their organization is who are receiving the awards. And it's clear that for some societies, women physicians are underrepresented in recognition awards. This is Dr. Julie Silver's work um, from her own society, the American Academy of PM&R. Red is men, uh, blue um, are women. Um, and this is demonstrating the real paucity of women receiving awards, even though um, organizationally, almost 50% of their members are women. So where are the women? Well, maybe they're standing in the bathroom line. And I say this tongue in cheek, but this is, a, this is really a photo of what I think every woman can relate to um, in that the architecture of structures, whether it's a stadium or a concert venue, or whether it's an institution, an academic health center, a hospital and health system, has a lot of structural inequities built in. We certainly don't blame the women for having to stand in this line when their biological differences in their needs for bathrooms are very different than men, yet the, um, the organization that designed this structure made the rooms the exact same um, and maybe didn't even have as many women's bathrooms as male bathrooms. We don't blame the women for having to stand in this line and we certainly don't expect them to fix the problem. And this is why getting to more and more equitable environment is a two pronged effort that really needs folks at the top levels of leadership and the board to be giving the resources um, and uh, the strength of making sure those structural changes happen while the grassroots are assisting with that. And simple fixes like slapping a, a, a temporary sign over the men's restroom as what happened at an AMWA meeting I was at a couple of years ago are not gonna be sustainable. So shattering the glass ceiling is an urgent priority and we cannot expect women and others that are underrepresented to do it by themselves. So the solution has to be the same way that we approach how we practice medicine, it has to be data driven. We need to take a look at the data through the lens of an organization's mission, vision, and ethical code of conduct. We've got to talk about what our results are and, and basically publish them. We've got to figure out why we have the disparities that we have. We've got to implement strategies. We've got to track outcomes and adjust strategies as needed. And we've got to report and publish these results. 
So in this report, which comes from the Be Ethical 2018 publication, there are lots of different categories of metrics, and I'm just going to point out a few of them. There are several um, recommendations, pages of recommendations for all leaders. Board representation is key, and including underrepresented folks on impactful committees and initiatives is key to help to drive these initiatives. Financial allocation, control, and priority are also really key. Um, and we've got to make sure to, to check our own bias uh, at, uh, at the door. And for example, number one here is introductions. It's been well known that women are less likely to be introduced by their professional title than men when giving talks. And I have to say, I had to check my own blind spot on this as I used to do a lot of the introductions when I was the executive vice chair for education. And I did find that when I thought about it, I was introducing women colleagues who I knew well by their first names rather than their professional title. And I had to make a deliberative effort to train my brain to do it differently and do it the right way. Other metrics that are really critical here are allocation of administrative, clinical, and research resources, the types of training opportunities that we're affording folks, and the advancement opportunities, um, how we handle formal complaints of harassment or mistreatment, and really critical is to knowing where you're starting really taking seriously those workplace culture surveys and doing something about the results that you find. So this is a crowded intersection and there is a lot of intersectionality here um, of equity that I want you to all keep in mind. And it really does take a village. This was the last time that the ACP leadership was together. This photo was taken, and Dr. Dunn probably recognizes it, was taken in uh, at the American College of Physicians in one of our conference rooms in January of 2020 when we released um, our health equity paper. So we all have to work together to do the right thing because it bring, pulls us all up. The entire keel of the boat is pulled up. So in September of 2016, which ironically timed was my first month as CEO at the ACP, our young folks, our Council of Resident and Fellow Members brought a resolution forth to the Board of Governors for the ACP, where they asked us to examine and review our policy around gender equity, compensation and advancement for women physicians. And the way that the ACP, of course, works is that we do very much evidence-based policy. This resolution passed by our Board of Governors, which is kind of like our house, so went to our Board of Regents, where it passed again unanimously. And it was sent to the appropriate policy committee for creation of a deep dive evidence-based um, policy with multiple recommendations. So in April of 2018, Achieving Gender Equity in Physician Compensation and Career Advancement was published in Annals of Internal Medicine, where we addressed physician compensation, family and medical leave, leadership development, unconscious bias training, research on gender inequity, and, and opposition to harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. I also want to point out that if you let a policy paper sit on the shelf and draw dust, it does no good for anyone. So you need an action plan. How are you going to make these policies live on the ground and deploy them and implement them? So we went through a very multi-pronged process around a large initiative around women in medicine and, of course, took everything and everything was written in a way so that um, we could make it to some extent ex ex extrapolatable to other underrepresented groups to address that intersectionality and recently created um, a group of DEI resources as well. So please check them out uh, on the ACP web pages. So what have we done so far? So I'm gonna tell you our story. So we initially had a task force, which morphed to a subcommittee of our governance committee at ACP. So our governance committee is our committee of committees. It has gives us all the rules of the road for policies and procedures in every aspect of what the ACP does and oversees all the other committees. 
we now have gotten to the point uh, along our continuum that our, um, we now have a DEI standing committee that reports directly to the Board of Regents and is chaired by a member of our Board of Regents. We did a deep dive into the mission, vision, and goals of the organization taking an equity lens. We updated our diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, and we established an anti-harassment policy and a reporting process that did not have barriers and was easy to implement. We also put into uh, place uh, policies around professional behavior at ACP events. We surveyed our current and past leaders to help to assess our needs. We supported our grassroots chapters to establish local DEI and women in medicine committees and programming. And we've helped to co-create a lot of programming for them. And of course, we have a lot of policy and advocacy, which also extensive policy around disparities that we're seeing in our patients. We forged a lot of external collaborations. We've established affinity groups within the college. We're tracking and reviewing our data. We're making adjustments, publishing it on our website. We've got some forthcoming publications as well. And what has informed this is the three C's of communication, coordination, and collaboration. And I'm gonna give you one example of a um, exercise in deliberate practice uh, at the college um, in terms of the MACP, the Masterships in American College Physicians and Awards for Women. So when we took a look at our data from 2007 to 2014, less than 10 women per year were nominated for MACP. And in the year 2002, uh, 2007, 2008, four out of 80, four out of 80. So I guess that's 5% of MACP nominees were women. Every single one was selected. In 2019, 2020, 27 out of 87 MACP nominees were women. Eight out of the 27 women were selected. So two thirds of them were selected versus one third of the men. This represented about a third overall of MACPs and is about equal actually to the practicing physicians in the college, which runs at around the mid 30% range. And how do we do this? Well, we didn't have to decrease our standards. What we did was we ensured that we peeked around corners to find folks that might've been overlooked. And when we did that, and uh, basically deployed a large group of folks to start peeking around those corners, um, we did find superbly qualified exemplary candidates for MACP. And the same thing with awards as well. We've increased the number of women who have received college awards. One a reflection though on the awards that organizations give, and you may have reflected on this for your own organization, is that they need to evolve and really track the contemporary and, and changing values, evolving values of your organization. So we're, you know, we asked our chapters to reconsider why aren't you giving out awards for early career physicians, mid-career physicians, women in medicine, international medical graduates, because it's really important that that pathway, and that starts for ACP with our chapters, it's very important because that's a big feeder, of course, into the national recognition. The other thing I wanna point out is that ACP's Annals of Internal Medicine leads the way. Our editor in chief of well over 10 years is Dr. Christine Lane. And she has an incredibly diverse staff. In fact, when we, when we looked at her um, editorial board, the one criticism that we had was that it was too bi-coastal and there was really no one from them other than one of the East Coast or the West Coast. That since has been uh, rectified. And again, with all excellent quality people, we made no compromises. We just looked a little harder and longer. So there has been a lot of balance at Annals of Internal Medicine. Now getting to a JEDI, just equitable, diverse, inclusive environment is not enough. You really need to make a commitment to becoming anti-racist and the college did this in the fall of 2020. Now I do wanna switch quickly to equity in the time of COVID because we've certainly seen the inequities. We've seen how people of color and people of low socio, lower socioeconomic status have been disproportionately affected by COVID. 
And we've certainly seen this intersecting US epidemic of COVID-19 and lack of health insurance uh, bear its brunt. And the hope that we must be different the next time around on so many levels. There's also been the COVID conundrum around what has happened to the healthcare workforce um, during this time. There's really been a disproportionate impact on marginalized uh, populations, essential workers and healthcare professionals. In fact, three quarters of healthcare professionals infected with COVID have been women. And now may also re re reflect actually the, that the large number of nurses, for example, in the United States are women. Women physicians were uh, disproportionately working the community's hard, hardest hit by COVID. There's a perpetual second second shift or a third shift frequently that falls squarely into the lap of female health care professional caregivers. And there's a really good article that, uh, that Shika Jane wrote in the Journal of Women's Health in 2020, um, demonstrating that we did not make a lot of adjustments during COVID um, in terms of promotions. We still really tied that career advancement to clinical revenue and grants. And that really um, did unfortunately um, target women and those that had dependents in the home for which they were the primary caregiver more so than others. It disproportionately affected them. We also saw that because there are, are a lot of women involved in medical education at organizations, there was this rapid shift uh, and morph uh, to virtual curriculum, et cetera, that fell squarely in their laps as well. If you actually take a look at um, the publication gender gap, um, the orange bars are 2019 papers and the blue bars are 2020 papers um, for the second quarters of those years. And basically overall, you saw about a 20 to 25% decline in women as first authors or last authors in papers. And we saw the same thing uh, in this study published in Nature of last year. We also saw fewer grants being um, put in by women uh, when we compared 2020 to the same time period in 2019 with the orange bars uh, being March and April of 2020 um, and the uh, gray bars being um, some months in 2019 and 2020. Um, and regardless of what, uh, what clinical trials database that you looked at in the US, it was the same story. There's also the inescapable pressure of a woman being a woman on Zoom. I was just saying before we started uh, that I've got my small dog here sitting with me because there's no one else in the house right now. And uh, I firmly suspected that, you know, she would be barking and scratching at the door. Um, but I may have to jump up during this if the doorbell does ring. And when I look at interruptions on Zoom, 90% uh, of the time, they're women that are getting interrupted by their kids or their pets, um, sometimes men, um, but it really happens uh, much more with women. So what can we do? How can we take full advantage, actually, uh, of some of the things that we've seen during COVID and get to a more equitable environment? Well, thinking about promotion and tenure clock stops and shifts, how do we give credit um, for those rapid pivots in the clinical and the educational and service realm, the media and advocacy work that so many folks have been doing, social media research. Um, I think it's really critical that we ask these questions to make sure that people are fully getting credit. What I'm gonna tell you is I don't know how you decided to, to change structures of shifts and services and staffing, but there are some organizations in the US and academic medicine that made sure that the diversity, equity, and inclusion group, their committee, was involved in all of those decisions to ensure equity. Because what we have seen is sadly that during COVID, the majority of healthcare professionals that have lost their jobs or been moved to part-time or moved to more part-time than they already were, were women. This is actually Dr. Vinny Aurora's, um, this is a, a screenshot from a seminar that she subsequently published um, from the Women in Medicine Summit it was a uh, webinar that she ran in 2020, where she looked at ways that institutions could look at these clinical research, educational, service, advocate, 
advocacy and media and social media extra work, additional work that folks were doing and give them credit. Also, Dr. Gottlieb published in JGIM last year, Minding the Gap, taking a look at organizational things that we can be doing to promote gender equity during COVID-19. And it was built, it was broken into four categories, including academic productivity, compensation and professional effort, career development, and family support. Uh, and one thing I want to I want to put out here for your strong consideration is how we just expect that our healthcare workers don't have a personal life, our healthcare professionals, and we know that the burden of child and dependent care falls squarely in the laps of predominantly women. So how can your organization collaborate with local organizations such as childcare providers to create? or reopen care centers for children of essential workers? How could you do that with a dependent adults? It's a question all of our institutions should be asking. We can't expect that miraculously some nanny or an au pair is going to appear uh, to help our folks out during these times. Now, the question is, if you build it, will they come? And this is a really interesting study out of the University of California system. They have had flexible policies around family and childbearing leave, stopping the clock um, since 1988. But in this study published by Dr. Hal in Academic Medicine in August of 2017, only 6.7% um, of women and zero men used these policies. Why? Well, we can see how this could happen. We're always concerned about burdening our colleagues. Like many of you out there, I know I dragged myself to work on days where I was sicker than some of the patients that I saw. And I probably shouldn't have done that, but I didn't wanna burden my colleagues. Um, maybe there are perceptions that folks aren't as committed and that combined with an unsupportive culture can really torpedo someone's reputation. Concerned about career damage and limiting your future opportunities and FaceTime bias. So this flexibility should be mutually beneficial. It's gonna result in superior outcomes. And I would urge that you think about policies like this as opt out, not opt in. So what we know, women and underrepresented in medicine, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups are recruited, evaluated, advanced, promoted, mentored and sponsored and compensated differently than those in the majority of power holding groups. And this holds true for UME, GME, practicing physicians and in patient satisfaction data. There's data around these women conference introductions, speaking time, the number of times women are interrupted or when their comments are appropriated. Um, despite the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine requirements that double AMC affiliated hospitals and healthcare orgs maintain a clearly written bill of rights and responsibilities that should communicate a zero tolerance policy for sexual harassment during healthcare workers, in this study from JAMA last year, when they pulled 55 academic health center policies, zero out of 55 contained the recommended National Academy language against patient perpetuated sexual harassment or abuse of your healthcare practitioners. There's also emerging data around the prevalence of personal attacks and sexual harassment of physicians on social media with women um, reporting significantly more online sexual harassment than men. This is also holds for residents. And this is an article that was published late last year that looked at UCSF, UCLA and Duke internal medicine residents. And the black bar here is Latinx or black. The green gray bar is Asian and the white bar is white. And these are participants ever experiencing bias patient behavior by race or ethnicity on the left and on the right. Um, the black bar is men, the green gray bar is women, and this was reported bias behavior by gender. So belittling or demeaning stereotypes, role questioning, 
explicit epithets or rejection of care and sexual harassment were borne much more heavily by people of color and women in these two internal medicine residency programs. And this is just um, the uh, tab tabular form of that graph. So here, this is the table that talked about the frequency of responses used to address patient biased behavior. And um, essentially, very rarely um, did the respondents report to their attending physician or their chief resident or to their institution this behavior that they were suffering. They just sucked it up, they dealt with it, they maybe set some one-on-one -on -one limits, they may have talked to their peer colleagues or family members about this, but many of them unfortunately didn't even know how to report this. They had never talked about this. And I would urge you, something that I've been urging all the groups that I've been talking to about this is to, just like you do rapid response um, scenarios for common clinical scenarios, I urge you to very proactively do team-based training in how teams are going to respond to this and individuals are going to be respond to biased behavior, um, harassment on the part of patients, visitors, or other healthcare practitioners at your institution. Chance favors a prepared mind. And sometimes these things happen so quickly and you're so shocked by what just happened you're, you're just catatonic. You don't know what to say or do. So I urge you to think about how you can prepare your teams to talk about how you're gonna handle this. I'll give you an example from an institution in New York that I did grand rounds at a few years ago. Their policy was that if there was biased behavior or harassment uh, by a patient uh, or a family member or another healthcare uh, person, and there was another team member in that room, that other team member would say, excuse me, patient X, um, we have a very professional environment here to, ins to ensure high quality of care and safe patient care. That was very disrespectful and unprofessional. We ask that you not do that again. We treat everyone at our institution with professional behavior. Because when you get to the level of harassment and discrimination and when it becomes legal, you are really only seeing the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot that lies beneath there. And if you take a look um, at the misconduct database, um, and this was a study uh, that reviewed results 1118 to 419, it's sad to see um, where we are in terms of reported and documented allegations um, and proven allegations of harassment um, and discrimination. So this was the faculty sexual misconducts that were in this database. And as you would imagine, there, there are very few folks that rise to the level that they're gonna get reported to this database. So 125 faculty sexual misconducts, about three quarters of the perpetrators target subordinates. The majority of perpetrators were male. About half of them were full professors. About a third of them committed sexual assault. About a little over half sexual harassment. 49% resigned or retired. 21% were terminated. But 50 of these 125 accused faculty remained in academia. 60% at the same institution and 40% at a different institution. Now, a really important factor to take into account here is that this means something to the AAMC, the ACGME and the Joint Commission. And the role of US credentialing, accrediting, licensing and rating organizations is key. And if you actually look at language for these different organizations, it's there. The ACGME and their common program requirements in 2019 have several sections that talk about diversity and inclusion, as well as more specific requirements for lactation facilities and disability accommodation. Dr. Lisa Bellini saw that this was the biggest issue for women of childbearing age at the University of Pennsylvania. This study was published in the Journal of Women's Health. They essentially went around and were able to locate safe, accessible, easily accessible um, lactation space for 
women who worked all over their campus because they had a commitment to do this. Um, because this had, was the major reason um, why people felt that there was uh, a less than optimal culture there. You also take a look at ACGME um, um, common program requirements. There is strong language about the learning and working environment. And again, that recognition that safety and quality of patient care is inextricably intertwined with being an environment that is free of harassment and discrimination. This is also seen in the ACGME CLARE, their clinical learning environment review, professionalism findings, and the Joint Commission additionally has language around um, the particular areas around harassment, discrimination, diversity, and inclusion. And because it happens, and this is actually an article um, that took three ca real cases out of the Joint Commission that Dr. Anna McKee, who is the Chief Medical Officer at Joint Commission, and I and Esther Chu wrote around sexual harassment between healthcare workers and safety culture and how it directly undermines um, safety of an organization. So allyship can no longer be an option but an imperative. So I urge all the men there and all the women out there, include the men in your conferences. They need to understand what's happening and they need to help to get to a better place. So change those likability penalties, evaluate performance fairly, give women credit, share the office housework, make work work for parents. More and more of our younger physicians are two working parent families. Mentor women offer equal access. And if you wanna take a look at top 10 catalyzers in summary, what I'm telling you and asking you to, to work together to do is to perform that foundational work with that equity lens. Review all your policies and procedures for governance of your organization and all the aspects. Make sure you have anti-harassment discrimination policy, anti-discrimination policies, um, and that you've committed to becoming an anti-racist organization. You've got to establish um, a body in your organization um, that is accountable, and you've got to make sure that the, that the group, it reports directly to the board. You've got to understand how you're allocating and prioritizing financial and other resources. You need to institute deliberate practice and transparent data collection. And you've got to track the entire continuum um, of, of caring for folks at your institution. You should be publicizing the data. You need to tell everyone what the elevator story is to get to a Jedi anti-racist environment and make it accountable to your board because she is someone's sister, mother, daughter, wife, so when you hear the word Jedi next, I hope that you don't think about them, but you think about them. And I wanna also share a special picture that I love, speaking of just equitable, diverse, inclusive, and broad-minded folks, Dr. Andrew Dunn, showing off his dancing skills um, on the floor at the AMA uh, in, I believe this was June of 2018 with Dr. Jacqueline Fincher, who is now the president actually of um, the ACP. Dr. Dunn did a lot uh, during his tenure in leadership at the ACP to move so many policies forward, and that is much appreciated. And I'm going to leave you with this thought. There's always might if we're only brave enough to see it, if we're only brave enough to be it. Um, so please follow, please follow us at ACP Internists. Uh, I'm, I'm in a little bet with one of my senior staff members that I can get more followers than him. So please follow me on Twitter. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over. That was awesome. Dr. Moyer, I really appreciate so many insights, so many really critical um, points. And I think it's uh, I think it's really important from your perspective and your view of the world to, to highlight this. Um, and I'm so grateful that your organization has done this on a national level uh, using your organization as a framework for other organizations. I think it's fantastic. I'm going to open it up to the group. We have a few minutes for some questions. I'm, I'm grateful for all of the participants. I see every level of participation from program directors to residents, fellows, and students, um, and other people that design courses. So this is just wonderful.
Andy, I didn't know you could dance. I was just glad it was a photo and not a video. <laughs> Andy could be giving dance lessons. I mean, add to to some of the others on the delegation. He's not just a great internist, but uh, he's also a phenomenal dancer. <laughs> I did put my um, email in there if anybody wants to email me. And if you don't feel comfortable emailing me uh, at my professional address, I'm going to put in my personal um, email address as well. I'm always happy to, to follow up with people post this. I sometimes have um, groups, women groups in particular, I give a talk on imposter phenomenon and negotiations. Um, and I'm happy to do that at some point with one of your women's groups or whatever, but I do thank you for the opportunity. Um, and here's to getting to a more just equitable, diverse and inclusive environment excited about that. Do you think that this year um, has really put in place a path moving forward? Or do you think this is a blip? Do you I mean, I'm interested because it feels like a lot more has happened. Um, yeah, I, think, I sense that we're, I sense that we're getting to a tipping point. And I think just like we want to say never again, uh, for how we handled this pandemic, because we know that it's not a matter of if it's just a matter of when the next pandemic will be. I think we are now really at the tipping point and we saw how so many people stepped up to the plate and worked 200%, 300%, went above and beyond. And we, we, can't, we can't lapse back. We need to capitalize on that momentum and all that we learned and move the entire environment forward. Because again, we're, we'll all be better for it. Our organizations will be better for it. Thank you for that. Can you speak to any measures or successful experiences in organizations moving from recruiting diversity to supporting promotion and leadership? Um, and you are in group. Yeah, so I'm going to tell you that just having one person of color or one uh, woman on a committee or a task force isn't enough. Um, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg always said she couldn't wait till the Supreme Court was all women. And people said, well, why would we ever want that? And she said, well, it was all men for all those decades. <laughs> um, again, we want the best possible people. So, and it's the same thing uh, in terms of recruiting folks. You know, if you have just one woman or one uh, person of color in your pool, it's highly unlikely they're going to be selected. So what you need to do is you need to take a look at the policies and procedures as your language bias? Is there implicit bias and some of the language that you're using? How about how people talk about candidates? And this is what I call the, you've got to push away the ether of ambiguity talk. You know, when someone is at a table and says, hmm, I just don't know about that person. They just don't seem like they're the right fit. There, there just doesn't seem to be something, there's something about them. I can't quite put my finger on it. You cannot tolerate comments like that. You need to have very specific criteria-based comments and really dig deeply about what people mean. And I got to be really deliberate at this with the CCCs um, in the residency program. Um, and when people would sort of float out those ether of ambiguity comments, I would, I would not let them sit there and sort of to toxify and infect the environment. You've got to really, you've got to look at every aspect. And I really urge you actually to take a look at the study I talked about from Dr. Beimer and Douglas from Duke that was published a couple of months ago about how they completely upended the apple cart. They really, it's very detailed and it has a really good roadmap for how you can do this, whatever you're trying to do, whether it's a fellowship, faculty, advancement, recruitment. Perfect. I know we're uh, at the hour. I'm so grateful for your time, Dr. Moyer. So, so grateful for all the participants for joining in. I know we all have a part to play in moving this forward. Um, thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Moyer. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.